So today on diversity, um, we, in chapter 1.1, we will be identifying and reflecting on our own social and cultural perspectives and biases. So here you can, if you want to just sit back and relax and watch the unit with me, but I do try go from chapter to chapter. Obviously I cannot read the whole book here. So I just skip through, you know, little bits here and there. You, it still benefits you if you do read through the book in your own time. Um, yeah. So in reflecting on my own perspectives and um, biases and the same little exercise that you mean to do, um, I will start off by telling you where I'm from and who I am. Um, I'm from Southwest Africa, Namibia, which is um, on the Western coast of um, Africa. Um, and I did my nursing training in South Africa in 1987 and have been working in HD for 30 years. So I looked after my grandma when she had a stroke and that's how I landed up in HD. And I absolutely love HD. And I do tend to um, rub it off a bit on my students and you might wanna go into HD when you finish. Um, but there's a huge need, of course, in disability. And HP is not really that different to disability care because ultimately somebody with dementia has got disabilities. So, you know, it's, um, it's very similar. I have never worked in disability. So I can probably learn from you guys working in disability a lot more, you know. So my, um, my dad was um, a colored person. He worked on the railways. We always used to say he was like a, um, uh, he worked in the monkey, monkey wagon because he was a conductor. He was at the back of the train and they used to jump out and change the, change the train over and stuff. Um, so I have um, quite a diversity in my upbringing as my dad being from a colored background. Um, in Africa, we do not ident identify with African or black Africans the way that um, somebody here, um, South Sea Islander or Aborigine will keep identifying even if they are, a, a, you know, a mixed race. We are either white or black or colored. We're not, you know, we don't, and, and not really accepted either. So white people don't really accept the colored people and the, the black people don't <laughs> accept, accept the colored people. So it's a bit of a dilemma. Um, I think the colored people are very resilient because they had to come through a lot of, um, uh, you know, just as the black people have had a lot of struggles, as, you know, um, the colored people just as resilient, having all of those challenges, you know, through their lives. So from a social background, social class background, my mom came from a wealthy family, my dad came from a poor family. So I had all the experience there, literally from the other side of the tracks. <laughs> and, um, you know, a lot of challenges within my mom's family and their attitudes and uh, you know, things like that. And of course, that's part of the economical diversity as well, that, you know, we also face, you know, really coming from um, struggles in Africa, you don't work, you don't, you know, there's no social structure. So if you're poor, you're really poor. You know, some of the African people live in tiny little shacks that's just made from steel because they, they turn shacks because they don't have income. They bought these places from cardboard and all sorts of yeah it's really hard sometimes and the gap between rich and poor is really massive so the middle class is not is becoming non-existent you know and a lot of um you know diversity in that so i've had quite a bit of hands-on experience of those in these areas um the racial diversity was just exactly the same thing really um religion you know we all know religion can be a diverse thing um, being, you know, from a religious background or non-religious background and the challenges that we face in between, you know, just um, Italian backgrounds, they can be quite religious if you, you know, work with people with Italian um, uh, heritage. Um, yeah, um, and, you know, the local cultures, they like practice practices and religions. We sort of, I suppose, in some sense, it's up and coming, but not a big, huge issue in Australia yet. The real big diversity between maybe Muslims and Christians, you know, which is the, the real dynamic um, thing that we see in Africa. Um, 
in places like Sudan, North Sudan is Muslim, South Sudan is Christian, and there has been a horrendous um, uh, um, war going for many, many years. In Australia, there is quite a few South Sudan, Sudanese people that live in Australia um, because they've just been completely and utterly, um, you know, like a lot of uh, uh, resistance, I suppose, that they've gone through. So, um, yeah, Australia, there's some humanitarian, humanitarian visas that these people have received from Australia. So there was a South Sudanese man that used to work at Coles in um, Mount Pleasant. I haven't seen him for a while. Um, really, really dark man. He comes through a, a extreme war, extreme war. My country was also in war for 29 years. So I grew up in a war, you know, just being aware of bombs exploding in supermarkets and, you know, always been constantly being on the lookout for things that's out of place or situations that's out of place. Um, in a big way, it was a fight against communism. And unfortunately, I think communism has won. And um, Africa is very, very socialistic and communistic at the moment. Um, yeah, people wanted their freedoms, but ultimately um, those freedoms have been sold to the Chinese. And, you know, the, the Chinese took over from the white people, and that's not, not much better anymore. So, um, yeah, so we are at the moment in, um, in a voting uh, time period. So, which of those count? <laughs> it's very important. Once you've lost it, you can't have it back, you know? So, yeah. Um, languages, I speak up the chance. I speak a little bit of German. Um, I, I try to learn to greet people in their own language. I can greet somebody in Italian and try and I've learned how to greet uh, Filipinos, but I, you know, sometimes my brain gets stuck on me. Um, yeah, so it's always a bit of an icebreaker if you do work with diverse people to just learn one or two words. Of course, we always learn the swear words first. Don't mm -hmm. know. <laughs> people trick you in it. And then, um, yeah, so yeah, it's good when you work with diverse people. If you, can, you, you can find a common ground. You can find something that you click with them um, just to break the ice and just to sort of, you know, build a bit of uh, um, a report with somebody, you know, when you're working with them, that's essential. And then, of course, in families, uh, my husband's British and I'm Afrikaans. And, you know, in our family, the British does things differently, very differently. And, um, you know, so within your family, you can have diversity. You know, you can probably be from two different families, not the thing, maybe same background as well. And just the way you do things can sometimes be... Uh, in conflict or have to be resolved in some way. Um, us Africans are not like Australians. We have really dry jokes. We are really like, um, you know, uh, our humor is very, very, yeah, really sometimes a bit crude. And of course, the British don't get that. They, you know, my husband will go, that's not funny. And I said, that is funny. And he says, who's <laughs> laughing? And I'm like, cracking my head off because I was said something and he just, he found it offensive, you know, so, um, yeah, so within families we can, we can sometimes struggle. We all look the same and quite often somebody comes from the outside and they say, well, you just look like any other Australian, you know, because we look the same, people may assume that you know, we're all the same. And then, of course, we have that cultural blindness. Um, if you haven't met if you don't, if you're not friends with a Chinese person, you know one or two Chinese people. All Chinese people look the same. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same with Africans. If you don't know some African people, all African people look the same. Guess what? To the African people and the Chinese people, we all look the same too. We really do. It's like the Filipinos; they all look the same to us, and vice versa. For them, we all look the same, and you think, well, really, we're all so different, you know? But they think the same way. Why do you think we're all the same, you know? Um, so there's, there's that cultural blindness that we all struggle with, you know, uh, which easily will create those kind of um, biases and misperceptions, you know. So um, in this uh, diversity, it, as it may include all of these things, there's other things like, of course, age, personal relationship, but 
you know, a generation that's gone through the war or a generation like 80 babies, we all, and then we've got the 90 babies, we've got the, the swingers or what were you, the, the 60s, the 70s, the rock and rollers, and, you know, and uh, the baby boomers. And I always have a little giggle as, you know, some of the old people who look at the young girls and they'll go, oh, look, she's got hardly anything on her. And I think, have you seen any photos of yourself in those days? <laughs> go and look back, you know, my mom's wedding dress was just that long. And that was their wedding dress. And I'm thinking, you know, really? And then they will be quick to say, oh, look at these youngsters. They've got hardly anything on, you know. <laughs> Nothing has really changed, you know. And then all hats off to the older generation. Imagine what they've seen already. They've gone. <sighs> My mother-in-law used to say her grand, her grand, or her grand, no, her, yeah, her granddad. She met him before he passed away. He was 107 when he passed away. He went from the penny lane bicycle to the moon in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. So imagine all these things these older um, generation has seen, where they've been, you know, learning to work. And I mean, Kamala is amazing with the computer. She's better, better than most of my other students. She's got that unit sorted and it's different colors. It comes through like a professional, you know. So, you know, amazing. And I'm thinking, well, you know, some of the youngsters will go, oh, look at this oldie. What's wrong with her? You know, why is she even here? Can she still work? But she's got a lot on us. She can teach us a lot. And that's why I love sitting at the feet of older people. So I love working with older people because I learn so much from them. You know, they just, this, uh, this source of information that we really need to sort of harvest before it's gone, really. So, yeah, we're learning from people. I and mean, then there's other things like, of course, disability. Not even talking about that. Just imagine how many different disabilities there are. So I, I, I struggle sometimes to um, try be clear on examples on different disabilities. Um, it's almost impossible. Every time you're going to go and look after somebody, you have to go and learn about their specific disability because I can't prepare you for all of the different disabilities you're going to be seeing. From, you know, you, oh, we've got the general ones, hearing impaired, maybe blind, maybe they are in a wheelchair, they're, they're paraplegic or something like that. You know, we talk about um, uh, autism, the spectrum is just far out, you know, and this is so many different disabilities and each disability comes with some unique characteristics, but on top of that, there is um, obviously the individual behind it that got their own background, their own set of rules and principles and, you know, likes and dislikes and all of those things. So it is quite out there in our industry. We talk about the diversity. And when we work um, in this um, services, we also learn that a lot of the people we work with, like I said earlier, a lot of Filipinos working with us, especially in HD. Um, and it's really hard. When I first came to Australia, Working at the Shepherd Lodge, when I first started there, there was 90% of the staff was Filipino, and a lot of them had a real thick accent. And you know, these poor oldies are sitting there and they couldn't understand half of what we were talking. <laughs> and even my accent at that stage was quite heavy. So they'd like, look at me, they'd just be quiet. And it's so sad because they can't understand us, you know. It's, it's really sad. But there's, you know, obviously. If, if there's a need and, and companies bring people in to fill the need, then, you know, that's how it is. Um, and luckily, over the last few years, it's developed quite a bit and it's become more person-centered and people, older people have realized that they sort of can be a part of what they want and who they are and, you know, where they live. And um, it's gotten a bit better. There's more joy and more laughter and more, you know, chatter, chatter going on in, in HK now than what there was even as much as eight years ago. And um, we've got lots 
amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wonderful. Yeah. And absolutely, that's what the new HP, HP standards is about. And I've been working on the disability standards this year. And it's all about their dignity and choice and the whole thing that, that runs the whole the whole plan is that they're more involved. We now worked in the UK, I worked in the UK for two years um, with a company called PSL. And um, we already applied a lot of these principles. So when I first came to Australia, I was a bit taken back. I think you're still very rigid at that stage, you know, things were just like, oh, you have to get up at six o'clock and have to have a shower and have to go for, for breakfast at eight, where, you know, I mean, if you want to sleep in, and I used to say, well, I'll have it on my care plan. I like sleeping late. And I like having a, a glass of wine at night. And I like my own arbitrary. Don't tell me what to do, you know? And it has come a long way over the last few years. And we got it um, right quite uh, well in and, and, um, Whitehaven, which is the high care dementia unit, because we started applying a lot of the principles which I've learned already a long time ago. And then the rest of the chef that was looking at us and saying, oh, you're letting them sleep. Oh, that's, you know, it's less stress on us. You know, it's less stress on your clients. So if they want to do something, let them do it. Um, you will face the, the different the, or the other side of it. Then when you go out into the community, you're going to run into these old carers that uh, did their courses in the 80s and never did an update, and they still run things on this rigid roster. And then you come in and you say, well, you know, it's actually what they want. And they go like, no, it's not. Things don't work if, it, if it's the one done the way, you know, they want. We have to, but really at the end of the day, behaviours and things are all uh, the source of that often, quite often, is when you force somebody to do something that they don't want to do. Yeah. I mean, just... Yeah. Forced to do things that you don't... Yeah. And I mean, really, it's the home we're working in. We, they're not living in our work. So we have to get our brain sorted here, yeah, you know, we have to understand. They can do, they can come and go and do whatever they want to, and we have to fit in with them. Yeah, and we will talk a lot more about that, because sometimes duty of care does have a bit of a conflict with that, but yeah. So um, with, uh, with this, we might consider that culture is the way of life, including uh, customs and belief. Race is the biological or uh, genetic group, which is most often determined by skin color. And it, ethnicity is a person's identification with the social or cultural group based on their experiences, traditions, and uh, rationality. I try to identify in some ways, I, I really get some of the South Sea Islander people's mindsets and the way they are because my dad was a lot like that um we eat a lot of the same food which is very really interesting because we love apple which is the you know the intestines and stuff but we you know we have those those um we call it fake cook which is the the bread they make the little buns they make they call it sweet cakes or things they call it we eat that we eat a lot of our food is very similar so there's that identification, that understanding of that culture, which is really amazing to me, that there's a culture around, on the other side of the world that is a lot like my dad was, you know? He would sit under his tree all day and do nothing. He was <laughs> quite happy to do that. <laughs> there was no ambition at all. You know, and it was fine. It was, he was happy. He was happy. What makes it wrong, right or wrong, you know? Just our Western way of thinking, like you have to go and you have to earn this money and have these hard roads and high rises to be to be happy. So just because it's different doesn't mean it's wrong, isn't it? So um, I don't think this is working. I don't think this is working. 
I have a little video here, but I don't think on my can, so I don't think it's working. And now I've hanged up myself. Oh, come on. Did you want to have a tiny little break to stand up and stretch? Yeah. yeah. Have a little quick break. Because my computer's just hanged up. This is a special week. Does anybody know what it is? Brotherhood. Brotherhood. Treat everyone as though he was your brother. And is there anyone in the United States we do not treat as our brothers? Yes. Oh, yeah. the black people. Who else? The Indians? Absolutely, the Indians. Sorry, I just want to share the screen with the Zoom. Many places in the United States. How are black people treated? How are Indians treated? How are people who are of a different color than we are? They don't get anything in this world. Why is that? Because they're different colors. You think you know how it feels to me just by the color of your skin? I don't do you think you know? No, I don't think you know how that felt unless you had been through it, would you? It might be interesting to judge people today by the color of their eyes. Would you like to try this? Yeah. Yeah. Not quite fun, does it? If I'm the teacher and I have blue eyes, I think maybe the blue eyed people should be on top the first day. I mean the blue eyed people are the better people in this room. Well, oh, yes, they are. Yeah. Blue eyed people are smarter than brown eyed people. This is a fact. The brown eyed people do not get to use the drinking fountain, they'll have to use the paper cups. The brown eyed people are not to play with the blue eyed people on the playground. Well, the brown eyed people in this room today are going to wear collars so that we can tell from a distance what color your eyes are. Ready and already? She's a brown eye. We'll begin to notice today that we spend a great deal of time waiting for brown eyed people. I don't think you guys think she is. She's coming to the floor. Can we just let the brown people out of the house so they'll die and get out of the Oh, you think if the brown eyed people get out of hand, that would be the same for you? <laughs> Who goes first to us? The blue eyed people. Blue eyed people may go back for a second. Brown eyed people do not. But you don't? Oh, no, that's not. Thank <laughs> you. 
they're smarter than the right people. And if you don't believe it, look at Brian. That is what we want to find to use because Pastor Don and I showed him the whole class the first day and it took him five and a half months to get to the third class. The second day, it took him two and a half months. The only thing that changed was the fact that now they were superior to the some videos online where um, they're obviously all grown up now and they all get together <laughs> and have it, you know, sort of um, from, I think that, that was done in the 70s. So, yeah, yeah, it's a long time ago, hey. Um, yeah, it's such a, it's the best example I've ever seen. So, yeah, I keep going back to that. Yeah. 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 It's just awesome. Yeah, it's just awesome. And if little kids react like that, can you imagine, you know, um, just how grandma that is? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that would have been out there, yeah. Even that example would have been probably been frowned upon in those days because those were like much different times than what we're living in now, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. So, yeah, I don't know why they took it on Facebook. I have no sort of, you know, you just can't find it on Facebook anymore. But I'm glad I found that short one now because that's the one that was on Facebook. And there was longer ones that the previous time I was looking for, I couldn't find it. Um, so, yeah, then we, um, you know, as we said, there's so many different disabilities. When you start working with people with disabilities, it's a good idea to just try to find out as much as you can about that disability. One of my students um, worked with a man that's got a, a, a acquired brain injury, and he sent me this whole big book that he found online, and it was so good because he learned about, you know, what his client's disability was. So that's the idea, you, you know, when you start working with somebody, sort of find, find out about who they are, what kind of um, things you can expect. 
There's a really good show on Netflix. It's called A Love on the Spectrum. I really I recommend like that. It, I put the biggest smile on my face watching it. I just, it's just incredible. It's these people with, um, with autism meeting up and trying to date and trying to be social. And yeah, the one, you know, they just, it's so cute because the one guy is like really proper and he uses his words and he's so particular about the way he holds himself and then trying to communicate with somebody else. You know, it's kind of yeah. Yeah, very formal, you know, it's really cute. It's yeah. on Netflix. Love, love on the spectrum. Yeah. Michael, yes, he's the one and he's back with his parents in the house and he says, you know, just, he says something about having sex or something also, and it's like really out there. And his mum and his dad is like, really? Because <laughs> he, you know, trying to uh, put his head around starting to date somebody and mm -hmm. making friends with somebody. Because quite often when they have autism, they, they struggle with social cues. They, you know, cues, they sort of can't pick up on. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> so they can be quite blunt sometimes, oh, can't they? Yeah. I'm horrible trying to communicate. But I honestly, I feel like this is something that's like helping me with this as well. Like just um, really being able to ask for communication with like someone else. Yeah. Like just like, okay, like, like, I'm not going to say yeah, the social cues is just not, not there. Not there. <laughs> you know, and I've had so many students coming through the school saying they've learned so much just to deal with their children. Yeah. It, that, that's huge as well. You know, you just pick up, I mean, if, if you just think, I mean, even myself, the way I raise my boys is so different to what, how I raise my granddaughter now. <laughs> because I raised my boys on that, on that, um, uh, uh, nurse's background of, of being rigid and you know and doing it my way and now I'm raising my granddaughter on this uh this background of you know trying to understand where she comes from and when there's behaviors there's 99 percent of the time she's trying to communicate a need so I'm trying to find out what does she want what's wrong you know so different so different to you how your perspective changed towards, you know. My sons would have just get on, gotten a whack on the bum and you get on with it, you know. <laughs> no choice, it's my will, you know. So, yeah, it's it's quite different. I can also email you the slides if you want this. Um, I don't know if you showed that. Okay, so um, religious, spiritual beliefs, yeah. I mean, we, um, yes, yeah, I said we luckily not to, not, not too many Muslims in the car because they, I think that's the one religion where there's quite a few uh, little things where you have to be careful not to think of things. I had one Muslim girl in my two classes back, um, but she was really um, easy to get along with. She, she didn't have any issues. Um, you know, she quite often baked some things for us, bring us, and when, when, when Ramadan was finished, she yeah. baked. Oh, cakes you. for everyone you know and she was like bringing all this food to class because now they can eat you know? <laughs> but she's quite cute and so you know we don't really have any extremeness or any issues in Makai really um so which we're lucky um and I think Australia is quite tolerant in any ways in the sense of like it is a basically based on Christian values and things. So it's a lot of things are sort of, you know, accepting Christians, they can just do their thing. So there's not too much um, resistance in that sense in your work in um, either. So you accept if somebody comes to you and are, you know, overly um, religious, just to deal with it and get on with it without taking the fence really. So, which is really good. Um, Places like in the UK, I think this is a real big issue because it's a smaller place and there's a lot more religions and yeah, and people just step on each other's toes and there's a lot of do's and don'ts when it comes to this, um, you know, specifically to this part. Um, yeah, but just even in how you address people, um, sometimes you, you might get issues where you uh, say, call somebody darling or uh, love or you know where people might take offense. I mean that's just something small, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's just a bad habit we have. I mean, I because my name is a little hard, so the old people never remember my name. So I always say, call me love, you know, that's just what I do. Um, and then I'll quite often say, and I've done this before, where I say, and it's just what I do. I say, well, you know, I've done something for somebody, I've given something, I say, oh, I don't know how to repay you. And I go, oh, my currency is love and kisses, <laughs> hugs and kisses. And, you know, I did that. The other day with the other trainer, I was signing his stuff off and oh, for no. about two weeks. He wasn't talking to me and I, was, oh, I think he misunderstood. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be careful because you do that with all people all the time, you know, and they go, oh, you know, how can I pay you? Can I pay you? Especially with dementia and you go, no, my currency is hugs and kisses and then they give you a hug and they're good to go, you know, no problem. And yeah, and also with the COVID thing, you have to be careful out there in the street saying that, and somebody comes and gives you a hug, and oh, you might get a fine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I put my foot in it sometimes. And it's also, it's a lot of people in the country, we were just like that, you know, everyone around the hey, doll, hey, doll. Yeah. 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 And the other bad thing we have in my culture, we kiss everyone. Yeah. So, you know, I stopped doing that a long time ago because my mother-in-law, so she goes around kissing everyone and then you get blisters. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm kissing people and I don't even want to kiss you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and then I used to kiss all people on the forehead and I was working with this young lady and he said to me, you know, everyone kisses her on the forehead too. <laughs> they're not going to stop okay, doing that yeah. too you know so yeah, especially if it's a family member come yeah <laughs> right on the mouth yeah. so and then we have gender issues and there's that's an arising thing um, our receptionist she's a transgender busy moving over so having understanding and respect for people having issues with that you know accepting it and everybody makes their choices even though maybe we might not always agree with some of the things or frown upon it or whatever we accept them you know it's everyone for themselves anyways you know who are we um i don't know if she's trying to be a male then she's doing trans she's busy trans trans him into a male yeah well, yeah. I mean, you can understand sometimes that goes wrong, and that's how it is, you know. Yeah. I don't always say that not everyone's born like that, but there's certainly an aspect of that. So, you know, certainly, depending on you. Yeah. 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 That is different. So, I mean, we don't know. And it's like just like any uh, misinformation with, when it comes to disability as well. You're not going to look down upon somebody just because they're Down syndrome. There's that little boy, um, I was on this morning on the news again, a little uh, dwarf boy in Brisbane that was bullied at school oh, and he's yeah. just made big news, with, you know. So, yeah, we, we try to be acceptable, accepting cultures. It's, um, you know, and sometimes we reflecting on our own biases, going back from where we grew up, it is sometimes really, really challenging. That is true. It's not, you know, it's no use saying something doesn't challenge you, you know, and just try to ignore it just because you want to be politically correct. I, I really struggle with disabled people. I've, and here I am teaching disabled, you know, disability mm -hmm. course. I've always felt really uncomfortable with disabled people. And it's only the last two years or so that I'm learning to overcome that fear. And I and I don't really know where it comes from. It might be in my culture where they were hiding disabled people away or um, parents or grandparents might have used the disabled person to scare the children with. You know, it's like, uh, if you're naughty, you're going to be like, that person or I'm going to send you there, you know, and that forms this, this block in your brain where you, you're fearful or you're uncertain, I suppose it's the unknown. 
but dealing with it and going through it and trying to identify why am I feeling like this and that's all what it's about trying to work through that um, and that includes gender gender issues it, it, it it's basically just learned behavior isn't it? it's not something a little kid will do when they haven't been told um, we spoke a bit about generations already um, sexual orientation it's very similar to the gender issues and there's some differences some um, sexual orientation could be um, it's more about being gays and lesbians which in a great deal a lot of us have already accepted that and haven't really got an issue with that other thing you know now some it's always like something else coming around so we um we all probably have some gay friends and are quite happy and and you know, love being around them. I love my my friends. So, um, then on the indigenous uh, indigenous Australians, Aborig Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people, um, they are also not homogeneous. So it means that they are not uh, within their culture. It's not a set. Not everyone's the same. Within the culture, there are different dynamics as well. There's um, a lot of clans and a lot of different cultural. Um, boundaries. If you go up north, you'll find cultures that are completely different to cultures that are down south. So you can't just put a blanket on it and say they're all the same. I um, remember working years ago, we worked in an indigenous group um, in Africa, and um, the Himba people, they, and within I've learned so much with, from their culture because they, um, they have these clans in each of the cultures, and I presume that it's very similar with the, with the Aboriginal people as well. But um, one clan was ironsmiths, another clan was, um, you know, they did jewelry and um, clothing, another clan did hairdressing, you know, they got these big hairdressings. And another, so each clan had sort of, so it's almost like surnames, like family uh, groups that landed up, uh, you know, specializing in some area. And then sometimes they would, um, they would bargain and trade with each other, you know, within the clan. So that's how the social structure worked. Um, a lot of that has disappeared as well because of the Western influences. But yeah, I mean, a lot of the indigenous cultures was based in that sense. And I suppose also it comes from even from the Western cultures, we had like the Smiths and, the, uh, you know, that, that re referred to Schumachers, that the referred to our... Uh, to our trades, that was the trades, you know, they oh, were yeah, shoemakers. Yeah, it's shoemaker, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Schumacher, so, which yeah. is the German word, yeah. So they they referred to their original trades, and that's what they, you know, sort of, yeah. Or like the Smiths would be silversmiths, or you get um, the Masons. There's Masons out there, and Masons are, you know, they were builders. So mm -hmm. it was all the different planks that did different uh, trades so and it's very similar within the, the you know the original cultures like Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people um so we talk about human rights um there's one question that says the difference between human rights and human needs so within the human rights we all have the human rights to be who we are and the human rights is um uh, you know a document but the human needs comes in that that's what every human needs basic things. We all need water, we all need shelter, we all need food, we all need education. Uh, you know, we have some needs, physical needs, warmth, um, you know, uh, emotional um, security or emotional support. You know, those are basic needs we have. And quite often when we work with people that are nonverbal or uh, um, uh, dementia, they're not able to communicate their needs, and then their needs come out um, in difficult behaviors. So, just as I said with children, you know, if they got a dirty bum, then they're naughty. They start jumping on the couch, and you get off the couch, and you want to smack their bum, and you go smack their bum, and you realize the bum's actually dirty. <laughs> <laughs> Before I put it everywhere. <laughs> So um, uh, then there's uh, the biases. This is the interesting one. I think on our big question, we have also to identify some biases. 
that is the perspective of the world around them. And as Elena, as a result in experience and influences from family and friends, biases may come in different ways. That includes discrimination, unfair work treatment, stereotyping, racial and offensive language. If um, we say, uh, you know, putting discrimination, putting people in boxes, so oversimplifying qualities, um, like uh, stereotyping, like saying all Asian people are good with maths, or all uh, people with disability needs pity and charity. Yeah. Well, nurses are female, you know, or all African men are good runners. They're good athletes, you know, just because the same bolt is a good athlete doesn't mean all of them are, you know, or they all, you know, good, they got all good rhythm, you know, and it's not necessarily so. Yeah, yeah, you did. So that's that, that, that makes it like stereotyping or, or, or bad one, you know, all Africans stink, you know, we have that stereotyping like oh you don't want to don't come and live with me you stick you know so um which is in it's, it's discriminating but it's also stereotyping um so overcoming this is through respect and courtesy um the fear of the different similarity between the cultures um and questions how you could ask your colleagues and your friends to learn about their culture you know um getting to know people um, so identifying these biases, it often are unconscious and we act on them without thinking. To identify biases, we need to become more conscious of them. The one method of doing this is to uh, using um, word association to describe various people, which we just did. Um, write down the first thing that comes to mind when you think of Italian. What do you think? First thing. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a biased statement because you might be the one that doesn't, you know? Um, uh, uh, so a clues for association might be uh, a person with uh, with um, clutches, uh, crutches. What do you think? An accident? Yeah, broken leg. Yeah, it might, it might be a disability they have. So, but we've made assumption already before. Aboriginal person, man. Let's see, tank cutter. You know? So we make assumptions or, you know, or uh, seven day painters. So now, you know, we may be thinking, maybe not one of them are, you know? A, a gay couple in love or, you know, whatever association you make, you know? So yeah, we, we identify some biases. Reflecting on our own values may come again, like I said, from our religion, from you know, the media. The media use disabled people to encourage us or, you know, which is so unfair towards disabled people. Mm -hmm. You know, have a good attitude and there would be a picture of a little disabled girl smiling, and you think, you know. So what's a good attitude going to change the books in the library to Braille? Or is the good attitude going to make the stairs turn into a ramp, you know? So they still have to overcome and learn. And just because they're disabled doesn't make them special or, or give them extra abilities. They, they lived and have been born in the body they have and they just make do with it. They've learned how to, to deal with it and carry on. But we... We we try to we try to get inspiration from them. Oh, if you can do it, I can do it. It's a bit unfair, you know, putting that kind of pressure on them, um, uh, you know. So we talk about that uh, quite a bit more in some other units. Um, so yeah, we have reflected on that. Chapter one point two: Work with the awareness of your own limitations and social awareness. I think that is slightly overloaded. Limits in our awareness, we should always try to be aware that there may be subjects of which we don't have sufficient up-to-date knowledge. Other people may have different perspectives than us. People have social biases of their own and social changes uh, and what is considered bias will evolve. What the other day, um, or a few weeks ago now, I had, um, she's uh, the manager or something from the Forestry Aborigine 
Islander um, government organization, I forget what they called. She came to talk to us about it. And she had a lot of documents. She did a little bit of a history class um, on um, what, you know, what happened in the, in the previous century, how they used the Aboriginal men to go around as pet hunters and kill their own people. Um, and there was, uh, there was a lot of government documents that she pulled up and she showed us where they used offensive language. So then she said, like, um, if we write notes today, how would we like people in 100 years to look back on our notes, you know, to think what we are using, the words and the language we are using. But I think even that evolved. So as we will call people with disability, people with disability, that might change, you know, that that might be, be viewed as offensive in 15, 20 years time. These things does evolve. It doesn't mean that everyone's heart was the way that things were written in the past, but yeah, sometimes it's offensive and um, sometimes meanings change as well. Like in my language, there's some really offensive words that um, 100 years ago was not what we mean it today, it was meant something else. So, you know, um, these things does evolve, it does change. So we have to sort of um, also accept that. Social awareness might include um, also the history of people, the groups and situations and issues that face them now, and common ways of life and values within the group, then taboos and offensive topics within the group. I have learned recently as well a lot about um, the, I had did a unit on Torres Strait Islander and Aboriginal people and um, that they do, uh, and that's why quite often when a movie starts, they would say a warning to people that uh, there might be uh, people um, dead or, you know, from the past. Um, and because they see, they see that as offensive and, and you know, um, even mentioning people's names that are not alive anymore, um, like disrespectful. So when it comes to funerals and or having images of people, even like if I have a photo of a, a person, I don't know who they are, and I might have found it off the internet, that person might not be alive anymore. So just to, to, to I suppose, uh, consider that that might be offensive to somebody or that, you know, it might be in their culture a taboo to do, you know. Um, chapter 1.3, using reflection to support our ability to work inclusively in, un, with understanding to others. During interaction with clients or other employers and workers, you should refrain from imposing your values, beliefs and attitudes on them. It's important to uh, maintain non-judgmental. And the practices means you don't uh, make moral judgments that's wrong and immoral. You don't, um, uh, uh, that don't affect the person's, that is wrong or moral, and that will affect the person's well-being. Um, chapter 1.4, identify and act on ways to improve yourself and your social awareness. Um, chapter 2. So I'll just, you know, the whole of chapter one is basically, you know, reflecting on who we are, identifying where we stand, um, and, you know, identifying when we have problems. At the same time, I like being real, and I like being, you know, um, realize that sometimes we may find it hard to work up with some people. I remember working with a young gentleman, he was from... Uh, Nepal, and he was extremely um, uh, chauvinistic. That was his background. He believed women was underneath men, and you know he would not listen to the nurses. Um, he won't take uh, instruction from any woman, you know, because that was his culture. And in our industry, unfortunately, most of our managers and RNs are women. Mm -hmm. You know, and the one that I worked with is one, she's a really, really good friend of mine, but she's a real um, unique Aussie and motorbikes and cats and, you know, and she's got a, um, 
the Mohawk. <laughs> she's worn that Mohawk for 30 years. <laughs> she's just brilliant. I love her, but she's very abrupt. She's, you know, she is. <laughs> just, that's, you know, that's just how things are. And working with him, she said to him, she asked him to do something and he like took a piece at it and she said to him, you know, that's the Aussie way. And he took that wrong and he went to report her. He said that she was being racist or, you know, she was looking down at who he was and because it's not Aussie. And then I went back to her and I said, well, what did you say? What, what do you mean? So she said, well, I just mean it's teamwork. It's nature. And he misunderstood that and mis construed the whole thing and I went back to him and I said to him you know it's not the way you took it it's not that she is thinking she's better than you or you know this is the white way it's about nature it's about working together it's you know we're in this together type of thing you know and it was a big issue management nearly had to send her for retraining for her attitude towards other people you know because she was being biased you know, it's sometimes really unfair, but yeah, so these type of situations happen and it's all about communication. Um, sometimes we really have to go back and sort of try to get behind it. What did that person feel? Why did he feel like that? Why, what did she mean? You know, how, how do we understand that? Um, appreciate diversity and inclusiveness and the benefits. Value and respect diversity and inclusiveness across the areas of all work. So this is in chapter two. Diversity, diversity may benefit in the workplace because it allows people from different backgrounds with various skills to contribute. Uh, for example, in a customer service organization, having people from different cultural cultures can allow them to uh, relate easier to a wider range of cultures, um, a wider like, range of uh, customers, you know, if, and that's something that's uh, happening more and more. A lot of companies uh, like putting uh, Aboriginal culture, especially health care services, um, in the reception desk because it allows the, the, the wider community to accept that service and um, feel that they not, you know, they got the health in mind because I suppose there is that stigma to the government did not always have the best intentions when it came to their health and well-being so in, in forming those partnerships you know and allowing them to access the services so they um they try to make the face of the company that but obviously you know although tells was quite frustrating but if you call and you can speak your own language or you know i mean it's different some of them you you call and then you land up in a call center in india yeah yeah, which is yeah. not really diversity and that's not what we mean with this <laughs> um they're just doing that because the, 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 the office space is 20 dollars a month or something like that and this you know and the poor people working they probably earn like a hundred dollars a month and it's just exploiting people really it's yeah, it's um it's just wrong um, so you may respond to diversity by acknowledging um, the importance within the workplace and support initiatives of, um, to promote and utilize diversity, encouraging inclusive hiring processes and getting to know others in the workplace and the experience and potential. It is really great when you can sit down with, um, a, you know, with a diverse person and really get to know who they are and, you know, build a friendship with them. I've been to an Indian wedding. I've been to a Filipino wedding, you know, it's just, it's just awesome. When you make friends with these people, I've got a sari and I wear my sari. <laughs> it's too small for me now. <laughs> but, you know, when, when they accept you and they actually invite you to their weddings, I've been to a Filipino funeral, they've invited me to, I've been to christenings and birthday parties and, you know, because I'm friends with a lot of them, working with them. And I took the time to get to know them. And then when, you know, at the, at the, at the wedding, they would talk their language, but it's really great because they've actually, some of the words, they use English words to replace them. So you do know what they're actually talking about if you listen carefully. So, you know, not, and I know that's an issue when people talk their own language in front of another group of people, the Germans are the worst for it. And I come from a German colony, so, 
I know, they, you know, there'll be two Germans in the room and there'll be 10 other people and they will talk German to each other. So that's really bad. But even, you know, if you think about it, sometimes it's really unnatural to talk. My best friend is Afrikaans. She was born in the same town as me. We're both from Namibia. We've been, you know, friends for years. So for us to talk English to each other, it's a bit strange, you know? It's a bit weird. Um, so we try not to do that in front of other people, but when we do talk to each other, we talk in our own tongue, you know, and it's, and people, and we are aware that it might offend people, but it is weird to talk to your best friend in, in a second language. It's just how it is, you know, so, yeah. So inclusiveness in a workplace that's inclusive and make, um, makes all the employers feel welcome, regardless of their race, religion, disability, or sexuality. Behavior that is inclusive will ensure that all work, um, work members are involved in relevant tasks without discrimination. For example, with work meetings, supports to include all members of the work team and should, um, exclude, should not exclude anybody because of their race. You know, it's one of the country, you know, sort of our um, when you talk about human rights and, you know, discrimination, it is, it's law, really, it's law that we have to uphold. Um, <clears throat> chapter 2.2, to combine, um, contribute to development of workplace and professional relationships based on appreciation of diversity and in inclusiveness. So, sorry, I know this is, this um, slides are very, hard to see. <clears throat> so relationships, uh, professional relationships are the building blocks of communication in the workplace regard, uh, regardless of diversity. Important characteristics in workplace are trust, mutual respect, mindfulness and effective communication. It is always important to go back. We can misunderstand one another. I always use this example. My husband and I have been married for 25 years. I still misunderstand him on a daily basis. Do you understand your partner's is still alive? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you get on like the house of fire, he gives you a look and then you say, don't look at me like that. And he goes, what do you mean? How am I looking at you? <laughs> yeah, we, we yeah. still misunderstand. Yeah, and you're like, what have I done wrong? What? It's just your face, you know, and you're like, and we misunderstand each other, or, so, or they say something, and you're like, you know, don't talk to me like that, and you take offense straight away at what they say, you know, and it's like we think we know what they think. I'm we'll assume, and then it, you know, and we. <laughs> and if we do that with our partners, how long have you been mar married, Carol? Um, 23 years. If we do that with our partners that we've been together for so long with, how much more can we be wrong with somebody we don't know? You know, how much more can we misunderstand somebody we don't know or we just met? You know, so. Just always be mindful of that. But we can't, we, just because of somebody saying something does not mean the other time I was speaking how many said. The receptionist said that he shouldn't use the paper cups. He said, she's not paying for the cups. And he's like, I will use the cups. And she went on about, I'm drinking tea. And, and there's glass cups and, and you know. <laughs> and she probably means she drinks tea and the cups are stained from the tea. And just because the cups are stained, they're not dirty. And that you are allowed to use the glass cups. You know, you don't have to use a paper cup. The cups are not dirty. Oh. <laughs> you know, but he took it like she's trying to tell him not to use paper cups. <laughs> but she didn't, she didn't communicate properly. He didn't get the message. And it was like, he's taken offense at her. She's telling me, you go, oh, using the same cup all week. And oh, how dare she tell me she doesn't pay for the cups? And 
you know so it's it's so easy for that to happen if we don't communicate to each other properly you know so reflect on these perspectives and identify the backgrounds and act with respect uh, promote understanding um, chapter 2.3 so that's like i i like trying to decipher what people mean and you know what's the background on it and promote some understanding for for what's happened we can have a little break i need to go yeah i need to go too so we might have a 15 minute break yeah we might just throw this open i think everyone needs to go yes we'll keep going again um so chapter 2.3 um, use the work practice to make the environment safe for everyone. So just um, obviously tolerance and um, information, communication is very important when it comes to safety. I've, I have a few classes where I have some of my students that's worked out in the mines before. And um, they're so aware of this whole issue about safety use quite often in the mines as a uh, punishing or like a disciplinary tool. And, you know, um, and a lot of people have got a bit of a resistance to safety and, you know, and all this constant like um, uh, checks and, you know, ticking boxes and putting this and, you know, all the regulations and things. And it has caused the culture of people being very uh, negligent when it comes to, to safety. So, um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's caring for ourselves and it's caring, you know, indirectly, we always care for ourselves. And in our work, we do get to work with equipment um, and we have to watch out, not just for ourselves and for our own bats and our own safety, but we have to watch out for a client, we have to watch out for our partner. But often we work in a, in a team, we work two of us together if we have a harder client. And sometimes your client is the problem, <laughs> you know, because they've got behaviors and they can lash out towards you or, you know, you, um, they can do something silly, have a fall and you try to catch them and hurt yourself and that type of thing. In the, the context of diversity, um, it is different. Obviously, some of our Western things we do and the way we do things are quite different to the way they might be doing something in Nepal or in India or in Philippines. So if we have colleagues that come from these places, we need to really, um, you know, sort of take a step back, breathe, and try to explain things to them in a teaching way. I know so often I work with people and they, they would put their lifters in front of the, um, the fire extinguisher, you know, and, you know, really, we all know we should not do that, you know, we might need the fire. But um, I always go and I say, look, you know, you're going to get a fine. You know, that is, I think it's $2,000 for the individual if you put an, um, if you block a fire extinguisher or a fire door. So always use it maybe as a teaching um, opportunity to help somebody to understand the rules around fire safety and the rules around using equipment and um, putting brakes on. I know a lot of people get annoyed by the fact that you don't put the brakes on, you know, on, on um, uh, wheelchairs and lifters. You have some old darling walking around and she loses her balance, try to hold on to a piece of equipment that's standing in the hallway and if the, lift, if the brake's not on, she goes to the floor and we will end up having to do all the paperwork, you know, it will reflect on our time. So just trying to uh, use those opportunities as training opportunities if people do, and not just assuming that everyone knows that it's common sense you know we are all um except for you being a little bit younger than most of us are already mature we've already had children we're a little bit more safety aware in some things especially if you've had little kids you're aware of all the dangers you know that there's a vase on the table you can already see you know that vase going to the floor <laughs> You know, but when you're younger, you sometimes cannot always, um, it sometimes comes with experience. So just because it's our experience and we've got that background and that understanding of safety, not everyone does. So we have to have the understanding that, yeah, we're not going to 
discipline somebody, but we need to use it as a training opportunity. Um, if somebody does not understand the rules that are on safety or what safety methods are, oh, to try to get some translations. Um, you know, they have some really cool uh, little, uh, it's almost like little books, um, cartoon books for, um, especially for Torres Strait Islander Aboriginal people. And there's, a lot of those cartoon books are also translated in other languages that we can get in regards to, there's one on the HK standards. There's um, the government on the, there's a website on the government where there's a lot of training material we can use in our workplace for people from other languages, especially when it comes, if we don't have somebody to translate um, sometimes. And the other side of it is like most people that come to Australia, especially to come to work, have to do English test anyway, so they'll be clued up. The problem lies with when you bring in your mother or your, you know, the parents who come and help looking after the children, they don't have to pass the English test. So maybe not so much in our services we give, but definitely if you work perhaps at, at um, Macus or so, you might get an old grandmother that's coming and she can't talk the language. Uh, we still do have in Mackay, and I was surprised to learn how many um, uh, um, Maltese people there are that still just talk Maltese, you know, and they've been here for 50 years and they, they all they will go back to their, their mother tongue, you know, so um, just in safety. Now, cultural safety is the principle of making people feel safe in the workplace, place, regardless of their race, if, uh, ethnicity or other factors. Cultural and safe practices are those which diminish and demean or dis disempower the cultural identity and the well-being of the individual. Um, and just on that also, I know my husband was working out in the mines and he, um, he experienced a lot of um, racism towards him because of, you know, being from Africa. And um, yeah, he's made some recordings of people really, you know, swearing at him and calling him names and stuff. And it creates a unsafe place if somebody feels um, that they are not wanted or they, you know, not accepted. And not just an unsafe place for that individual, but an unsafe place for us as well. And I don't think we struggle with that the same in our communities. It's more out in the mines where there's not all the policing and stuff that we perhaps will go under, but it does happen. And yeah, and if somebody, and like I said with that young man that was from Nepal, some of the care workers were actually quite um, rude to him. And, you know, and it's hard because that's how he was raised and that was his background. So to have a tiny bit of understanding where he comes from and perhaps trying to find common ground where you can actually communicate saying to him, look, I mean, it's it's not that we're against your culture, but things are different, you know, and you need to, we can try to have understanding for you, but you need to have some understanding for the way services work. Perhaps you're not in the right industry then if you're going to take offense at a woman giving you orders, mm -hmm. you know, you maybe you should go and try something else, become a mechanic, yeah. we'll mm -hmm. see how it goes there. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so if somebody feels unsafe, they will do unsafe things, you know. I've worked with um, a, a Chinese lady. Oh, she was, she would just, she try to overcompensate. And I've worked with Filipino men like that as well, where they try to overcompensate. They try to um, please you so much that they actually get in your way. They like overexcited and they, you know, they're in your face. <laughs> with that, uh, with that Chinese lady, we were making the bed the one day, and she was just in the way. She just kept coming. She was just so much trying to please me to work with me. She's in the way, and I smacked her in the face by because she was right in here in the in the way where I was making the bed. I didn't mean it to, you know. And I had to say to her, "Calm down, <laughs> relax. We're a team. We we'll work together." It's amazing that you want to please me and work with me, but, you know, let's try communicate. I do this, you do that. Sometimes people come and you work in a team and you're busy taking your old boy's shirt off and then they try to do that too. 
just because they work with you. When we work in a team, we have to complement each other. You do something, I do something. You know, we go into the room, I will put the bed up, you get the gloves and the bag and close the curtains. I will go get the old boys' clothes, you go get the lifter. We, you know, we know there's a whole heap of things that have to, have to happen. We split the job, you know? Yeah, work together with each other. Don't compete and try to do the same thing at the same time. And that is quite often the problem with foreigners that happens because they don't understand what you want from them. And then they, I've worked with a young Filipino boy. He was, apparently was an RN in the Philippines. And I think he's stuck back in the Philippines at the moment because he went home just before COVID. Lovely young man, but a lot of the nurses did not like working with him because he was so overzealous. He's just in your way. He's just, uh, and the one day came crying to me and he said, oh, they've been so rude. They told him off. And I said, you, you have to understand, you can't take, because sometimes he would just disappear. He's so excited. He'd run ahead and go do things. And I said, you have to stick with your partner and let her lead you. Follow her. She's been here 15 years. You need to follow her lead. You can't, you know, we can't go looking for you, wondering where you are. You know, we are working together. So sometimes it's, it's very challenging. But, and that is... Yes, yeah, and I mean, I commend, I, like, I commended you for being like that, and so don't lose your zeal, but at the same time, just step back a little bit and follow me, you know, it's hard to work with somebody if you don't know where they are, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're not working together at the end, you know, uh, and you don't know what he's doing, he might be doing a heap of good things, but he might be doing somebody else's work, you know, because we're working in teams, we cut in half, and he might be going helping the opposition here, you know. <laughs> and we've got our wing to sort. So don't, you know, stay with each other and work together. So improve health and safety and well-being of others and empower the user of the services. Um, recognize the inequalities in various areas and avoid biases towards certain cultures. And it 99% of the time, it's about stepping back and um, communicating. You know, just take a breather and have a little chat. Just be open. Don't be scared to say to somebody, you know, I think you're a bit, you know, too zealous. Or I think, you know, somebody might take the things. Don't be scared to tackle the ball and, you know, talk about things openly. I know it's not in everyone's. And, Quite often what happens, if you keep quiet, you keep quiet, you'll end up losing your pool somewhere along the line. Thank you. I was going to say something else. <laughs> and that's true, you know, you land up at the end like, and you, and you then, because you kept quiet for too long, you know, and then it's not nice. So rather use it as opportunity. I work with a German lady, night shift, and she was, she was dead. She's really badly hit, a urine impaired. And then we work night shift and she's so loud. <laughs> and then she oh, yeah. and then she got the one day she got a letter from management of seven or eight things that they had complaints oh. about because she was just uh, she also hit strong, very oh. hit strong. And she would, you know, just do things her own way and in type of things and never communicate properly. And people took a sense of you know, which you are. But I quite often would take her and then I say to her, yeah, we work and then the buzzers are going and she's just got her, she's doing this now. She doesn't worry about what's happening. We are responsible for the whole house. And if somebody has a fall, it will be back on your shoulders. You have to help answering the buzzers, you know. Somebody else won't go to and say that to her. They will just go complain about her, you know. Instead of bouncing it back to her and saying to make her understand the responsibility and making her understand that she can get into trouble and when somebody understands that and then they own up then you know she takes the responsibility because now her own it's not about not doing the job or about training me or somebody else it's about my own reputation or i'm getting into trouble or could get into trouble and the minute you 
sort of flick it around like that, then you get cooperation from them. And we're all happy, you know, we all work together well. So I worked with her very well. I really enjoyed working with her because whenever she did something that was against the way I would work, I would take a moment and explain to her why I'm doing it that way. And the minute she understands my reasoning, she goes along with me. And I don't have any issues with that. Well, that's it. When you communicate and she can explain back to me, I'm doing it because, oh, you know, this is the reason why, then, then by all means, that's continuous improvement. Then you do, I'm all about working smarter, not harder. And in our industry, our, we can work hard. You know, so you need to find the shortcut. You need to find a better way to do things sometimes. And if you communicate with one another and she said, well, I'm doing it this way because I find it easier because of this and this and that. Yeah, then by all means, then it's easy. Oh yeah, you've got a point. And then you can communicate it to the next lot as well. Well, we're doing it like this because of this, you know, because this is the reasons. And then, you know, there's no misunderstandings. There's no conflict because conflict brings unsafe situations. This is where, you know, one nurse feel like hitting the next nurse with the foot pad of a chair or, you know, <laughs> you get into those situations because we're a bunch of women together and we can be bitches. You know, I've worked through bitches through the years. That can be really, really nasty. And if you can find common ground with people like that, sometimes the difficult people are the best people to work with because they their heart is quite often in the right place they're not there to please each other they're there to do the job and you can learn from them you know if you can click with them if you can understand the reasoning behind them I mean you've got smooth sailing because they're there they're there to work hard it's hard to work with somebody that's there to just be making friends or you know because they're not interested in the job always you know so finding that balance is really important Chapter three, communicate with people from diverse backgrounds and situations and showing respect for diversity and communication with all people. It's important to demonstrate respect, whether you communicate with people, whenever you communicate with people, this could be the difference between somebody coming away feeling satisfied with the communication and then feeling as though you didn't value the communication at all. This applies. Uh, to all forms of communication. Um, rec recognize and interact with diversity. Um, that's all about encoding and then the decoding, in the way we say it. So I'm gonna, I've got a little illustration and I think I've used this illustration in the previous unit as well. Um, and this is really amazing. And this is the same thing that happens between a husband and a wife because you you are you think about what you want to say but the way we say things or think about how we say things are influenced by our backgrounds you know our i have a lot of african sayings that i quite often translate directly into english and they might not have the same meaning so they come from my background and you know and i um and then i work out something and i think i'm saying something but because of my background, I, I've got this SIP, basically, my background is my, that prevents my communication being fluent as what it, you know, as fluent as what it could be or should be. Then again, you stand on the other side and you receive that through your network of backgrounds and understanding and how you were raised and, you know, and so, the, the message gets mixed up in the middle here, you know, it gets, what's the word, construed it. Yeah, confused. Yeah. So then you receive it and you're receiving a different message. You know, the classic illustration is when you play that little telephone game, you know, and you whisper, Chinese whispers. Classic, because at the end of the day, just because it goes through a few people, the message and what they uh, come out differently or come out wrong. So we always have to understand that uh, our culture, our background influence the way we say things. 
And we have to, sometimes you have to restructure a sentence or, um, you know, use a different illustration. Um, it's the difference between like, um, uh, um, you know, saying, for instance, saying to an African person, um, you know, the color white is like snow. If, never, if somebody has never seen white and you're trying to describe to them what is white, and you say, well, white is like snow. And they go, what is snow? I've never seen snow. But you re, um, uh, not redefine, but re, um, what's the word? Um, uh, contextualize that word. You put it in a different context by saying, well, white is the same color as clouds. Ah, okay, that's white. You know? <laughs> that might be blue, yeah. You know, it's like, you know, so that's the, the to use a contextualizing in, if you're working with a, with a plumber and, um, you know, and he will understand it from a plum, plumbing perspective, you use, something that he is familiar with to relate to and understand what you are saying, you know? So you try to figure out how could you get this message across that the person that is hearing it can really understand. So you try to put yourself in their shoes and you try to communicate it in a different way. Well, you see, okay, the penny is dropped. Oh, they really get what I'm saying, you know? Um, suppose it's like when you, when you were working with your kids as well, you know, trying to, Sometimes we have to stop and change our method of talking, maybe whisper it or, you know. I just stop. Yeah, and especially, <laughs> you know, and then. Because I yell, they all just stand around doing nothing. Yeah. Like, yeah, mama's mad, <laughs> yeah. And that's very interesting because that works in all sorts of contexts, you know. If you, if you lower your voice, then people are more attentive. They, you know, listen, talk slower or something, you know, just to try to get them, make sure that what you're communicating. When you work with people with disability, we may need aids because they, again, these filters could be their disability. It could be something as practical as a hearing um, problem, you know, you work with an elderly person with hearing aids, um, how to communicate, somebody with um, dementia. Uh, the, the way the brain's affected that if you're not in front of them, they can't hear you. If you're on the side of them, I had a um, young lady, she's actually still alive. She, um, she's in her 80s. She's got, uh, she's Down syndrome. And her one side, her hearing and her, uh, her eyesight is completely affected on the one side. And when you stand in the bathroom on this side of her, she can't hear you at all. And when and you, you're talking to her, saying two things and she doesn't, respond. The minute you go stand on the other side, she responds, mm -hmm. you know, and if you don't know that, you can't see that, you know, so you have to, you know, get to know who your client is and know how to, to get through to them. So the same with the blood for that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So there's these filters or noises and they talk about, when you talk about noise, you think about, oh, if it's loud, if there's music playing, um, that is a filter, but sometimes it can be a mental filter. Somebody can just be tired. You know, it's hard to listen when you're tired. Um, when when the incorrect emphasis, I love the way Australians um, talk with a question. You know, and <laughs> and the, the your you you musical when you talk. As Afrikaners, we very monotone. So I, I really can be very boring listening to it. We try to adopt some of the things when you and I communicate with people to just bring a bit that of putting the emphasis for the sentence in some way and you know trying to change the structure of my sentences just actually by using a bit of musical tones in, in your language instead of just being monotone. So that's putting the emphasis on what you want to communicate. Um, the intensive gender abbreviations, you're really bad for it again, you know, or the servo and, <laughs> and you know, all sorts of abbreviations that you use all the time. 
I want to get good shape, but they go, can you, we're going to do an ajo. And I'm, what the heck is an ajo? And the ajo is actually the brand of the purple machinery and the purple beds. But they branded the shower bed, the ajo only. Although all the machines are ajos. And then you work there and you think, ah, Joe, you know, what, which one do you want? There's like six different Ajo machineries here, you know, which one do you want? And just like, you know, it's like the pen that you brand, that you use the brand or, um, and we do the same, you know, the British does the same, you know, all cultures have a similar thing with that. Um, when you work with a Filipino nurses, they quite often mix up the, the, the genders, they go male, they go him for her or she for him or, you know, they, because they're in their language, they actually don't have that um, gender identification like her or she. It's all that one um, description. There's no difference. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, they'll have a woman or a man, but they don't have, what's it, the pronoun going saying she or her. So they don't have that pronoun. So that's why they confuse that or mix that up. And you have to identify or clarify that sometimes because the RN would tell you, can you go take his blood pressure and he's referring to a her? And you go, who are you talking about? Oh, Mrs. Jones. Oh, she says she, <laughs> not a he, <laughs> you know? And, you know, just clarifying that with them to make sure you are actually going to do the right thing they want you to do. And Quite often they are uh, RNs or are ENs. They are like sort of, in, you know, um, over us. So we are a global village. You know, we all, the whole world's borders has been mixed up. And um, in Namibia, we have uh, 96 different cultures. But in Australia, when I became Australian citizen last year in um, September, there was 29 different cultures getting sworn in with me. So, and when my husband did his, the, the beginning of last year on um, Australian Day, there was even more. So just in Mackay, there's so many different cultures, you know, we have to learn to work together, so, and understand. And within our, our families, my, uh, my daughter-in-law is Torres Sky Islander, my other daughter-in-law is um, a, a Maltese. You know, so I have this real mixture within my family as well. So in our families, we already have that. So to accept and understand. So getting spellings from punctua punctuation correct, um, uh, acquiring the necessary aids, using generic language, uh, learning the standards. In Afrikaans, we always say uncle and auntie to anyone that's older than or 10 years older than us. Uh, that's again one of the things we have in common with the Torres Strait Islander people because they call they it's not in your family but you call them auntie or uncle. Um, if you go and work with an older uh, Torres Strait Islander la uh, lady, you'll probably call her mama or auntie. You know that's just the way you show them respect. We have um, a respectful you, which is just one letter you we use when we talk about. Uh, the mayor or the president or the pastor, you know, we use that view, but it's a very formal view. Um, and we were taught as children, you never you and ya, you and you anyone, which is you, yay and yo, we say, we don't, our parents used to tell us, don't yay and yo me, don't you and you me, you know, I'm not your mate. They used to say, you have to show respect when you talk to older people. You never call them you and you that's kind of a real common pronoun. <laughs> How do you do it? You call them on their name or call them um, on their surname. I just heard um, uh, Christine Key's great granddaughter, she's like six the other day calling her grandma Christine. And I thought, that's a bit weird. I thought, you know, I thought it was really weird. It's, you know, you call me grandmother. <laughs> and I, you know, yeah, it's just a cultural thing, really, in some way. But I think that respect is getting lost in some cultures, you know, sadly it is. Because, yeah. I mean, 
Mr. or Mrs. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, really odd to me if you see a 60 or 70 year old person and you get this tiny book just calling them on their first name. It's, you know, it's really, really odd. <laughs> Yeah, it's really odd. And it's, you know, I mean, it is a generational thing and it's not a big issue for some people, but for me, it's odd. It's just, it feels odd. I suppose it's just teaching them that principle, you know, it's not so much about the way they talk to them. They can be still um, showing respect, but I'm under just understanding the principle. And we had a, a concrete way of, of displaying that where yeah maybe she does have respect for her you know <laughs> and she does show her respect but maybe in a different way but to try to get that principle across and when you work with with people always ask them how would you like me to call you because especially maybe not so much in disability but especially when you work with older people i know at right at home they've got an old lady the old darling that is an old doctor, is she still alive? Uh, I've heard about her, do you work with her? Yeah, and do they call her doctor or do they call her miss, Mrs. or do they just call her on her first name? Yeah, so if they prefer, yeah. Yeah. And that's good because you can communicate and ask her and say to her, how would you like to call me to yeah. call you? Because when you first open her paperwork, you might say, oh, she's a doctor. Yeah, you Do you want me to call, call you know? Doctor, yeah. 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 And maybe somewhere along the line, she would go, oh, you wipe my bum, so don't call me that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I used to be the one doing that. Yeah. So. We, we just need to try to figure that out as we, you know, when we work with people to show them that respect. Yeah, I looked after a doctor as well um, in home care. She wasn't that old. And I did, at the end, landed up talking, uh, speaking to her on her first name, calling her on her first name. But um, yeah, with the same with her, it was, um, uh, you know, first have to get to know her first and ask her as well, you know, how would you like me to call you? So chapter 3.2, use verbal and nonverbal communication constructively to establish and develop and maintain effective relationship, mutual respect and confidence. Nonverbal language is so essential in our, in our services, you know, it's the way we smile, how we look people in the eye, um, just even showing them gestures having our body language towards them, not, you know, putting our shoulder against them. It's little clues, um, reflecting back to them what they've said and that kind of thing, just to make sure that we on the same level, we show respect and we're attentive and, you know, we're listening to them. It's like a little kid again. When they come to you and they try to talk to you and you're busy with something and you're not listening to them and they won't give up. You know, they'll keep going, <laughs> even sometimes get naughty because you're not listening to them. But we tend to sometimes do that. But, you know, um, it is just, you know, trying to, to get, give your attention to that person when you're actually communicating with them. And then cross-cultural communication is a real good little example here. The different meanings and gestures and different languages, you know, in the UK and America it might be. Uh, okay, and I think here yeah, even we will say okay and send that little thing. In Japan, that's money. In Russia, that's zero. And actually, in Brazil, it's an insult. So it might be, you know, that really bad sign. <laughs> so, and so, but you know, I've learned this years ago. In um, in French, a thumb is a push. In German, a push is a cat. In my language, of course, is something else. <laughs> you know, so so even using the same word, which is, you know, you might use, and somebody might take offense by that. <coughs> trying to figure out, you know, why did you take offense at that? Um, in the nonverbal communication, please, you know, if um, 
some of the, I've read, I don't know, haven't confirmed this with the Islander people, and I don't think the Islander people as much as the, the, the Aboriginal old, older generation, they don't like it when you hold eye contact with them for very long. Um, you, um, yeah, I mean, so they feel that's intimidate, intimidation. And I know that I think with uh, the Muslim culture, that is a bit of a thing with them as well, locking eye contact in. Because it's, it's a bit like, I don't know, you also have the thing about if you challenge a dog, if you look them yeah, and you're challenging them. <laughs> You know, it's like putting a challenge on it. You ready? Here we go. So, yeah, or look down, you know, but not to hold that eye contact for them. And in our culture, it's a sign of respect. If somebody does not look you in the eye, you think they've got something to hide. You know, so the whole time you think like they're nervous or they've got something to hide. So, um, and being too close to somebody. I think we all... I have it, most people I've met. The other day I met a man and he was like really, I was like trying to, <laughs> and then every time I said he was coming to my space again. somebody that is got that's on the spectrum somewhere in autism spectrum that could be one of the mm -hmm. things yeah and also the space being too close or you know texture those type of things might be an issue for the sounds the way we talk um so yeah use of silence if you're too quiet for too long or not saying anything People might feel uncomfortable. My um, other uh, granddad is like that. Uh, if it gets too quiet, we start to talk about things. No one can really communicate. He's very hard uh, kind of man. Like you have to be clean shaven if you want to get a job. And you know. Yeah. So no, I have no tax. <laughs> and I find it very hard to communicate with him because. I know I'm far from yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, just trying to find that level of you know able to be able to communicate. And now that it's getting older, it's just getting harder to actually communicate with them. Um, so when it does get really quiet, I find myself just like trying to step up the level of life. You know, and if you've got yeah mm. and if you've got a good friend then you know i i'm it's my my job to talk so when i get home i don't want to talk and don't talk to me in the morning okay i don't talk in the morning first thing i cannot talk this morning oh my goodness we had a whole big crisis because i've got two sausage dogs and one of them had had the squirts last night down the bottom of the bed. So my husband didn't see it and he went off to, and it, I, I didn't even wake up yet. And he was carrying on at me about this and that. Oh no, what it was. Last night, Valerie has, my granddaughter has a little swan and it's got battery feet. And she went to bath with it a few nights ago. So thing is gone. So last night she asked me for the, for the swan. And I went to, I already had put it somewhere so it can drain out. And I thought, well, I'll take the batteries out and give it to her without the batteries in. I mean, obviously the batteries is going to run now. I haven't taken it out yet. So I went to get the screwdriver and I got the batteries out. I chucked the batteries away and I covered and I gave it to her. I said, well, it's not working anymore. This morning, I wasn't even awake yet. And of course, I left the screwdriver in the bathroom. So why is there a screwdriver in the bathroom? Where's the toolbox? And I'm, I'm still asleep oh, and on top of it, the dogs and food and the house as well. So early in the morning, he wanted all sorts of information from me. And I'm like, just leave me alone. <laughs> I'm not awake yet. I don't talk this early, you know, just 
So you sometimes silence is good, eh? It's yeah. golden. Just do it. <laughs> don't want to know about it. Yeah. So sometimes stress can be a barrier, and um, with uh, barriers the resistance due to the lack of trust. If you don't know somebody, you might not want to talk to them. Um, pre preconceptions, you know, just the way you think about who they are. You don't want to talk to them. They might be, think they're higher than you, or they might. You know, you might not just not know whether you can trust them or not, you know, and then you um, uh, sort of persist to talk to them. Sometimes it's like that with your bosses. I'm a bit like that with my bosses. I don't want to make chit chat with them because I'm not sure if I can trust them. And then one day, I told him to me, he said, in awe, I had no idea what he said, you know, he said, I don't know, 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 I don't know. Yeah, and that's the misconception, hey, yeah. Now, I, I, Spoke my one friend the one day. I've always thought, well, you know, why do people never look for trouble with me? Never, ever anyone will look for trouble with me. And I, I mean, I'm glad because I'm a pushover. You, if you shout at me, I'm gonna cry. So I'm done, anyways, you know. But I don't look it. So that's that's kind of my protection in a way. And then my one friend said her husband thought I'm vicious, and I thought, oh, that's cool. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so people leave me alive. But of course, you know, once you get to know you don't want to be known as the vicious person, yeah. really. But yeah, sometimes people might have that, you yeah. know, they don't know you, so they think you are something that you're not. I, I yeah. Yeah. And that's where people misunderstand my husband and I, because he looks like a total pushover, like he's just the kindest, softest, gentlest person. But actually, he if he was a woman, he would be a bitch. <laughs> really. He he can be so nasty, you know, and, and he can really and yeah, very, yeah. Sometimes illness and pain, obviously, if you don't feel well. Don't want to talk. It's got nothing to do with somebody else, you know, just because you're not feeling well, you know. Um, lack of common ground, lack of empathy, um, and then of course the cultural social differences. Be aware of that you be um, should be wary of communicating with different groups. For example, uh, when talking with Aboriginal people, you should not ask the persistent questions or direct questions, loud noises, then the eye contact. Um, invading personal space. And I think this is in general with most people, we feel the same about that, not just, um, you know, necessarily with Indigenous people. In communication, we display respect uh, through active listening and responding to needs and respecting all people involved in important, uh, respect all people and involve them in important decision making. Like you were saying with your mum being really excited about that that cup being bold. When you involve people in making decisions that's going to have an effect in their life, it really makes them excited about it, you know, and that's the, the heart of person centered care is involving people in making decisions and involving them in, in making plans that will affect their own lives. And respect, respecting people's cultural values, protocols and methods of doing business, and of course using the appropriate language. Chapter 3.3, uh, where language barriers exist, um, use effective strategies to communicate in the most effective way possible. So when increasing diversity in Australia, with increasing diversity in Australia society, it's more common to come across people who don't share the language with you or who aren't fluent in your language. In these situations, you may be able to rely on interpreters if you need to know uh, the inter available interpret resources available to your organization and its needs so you can apply them if necessary. 
I don't know, but I, I think interpreters is a little bit overrated, really, in the sense that I don't think they're as readily available as what we think they should be, you know, and, and it's really hard when you talk about a professional interpreter, um, if you are in the services in the community, you're working with somebody that I can't understand, because, um, you know, we most probably will rely on their family members to translate. Or, you know, and that's not always a professional interpreter. So if you get a family member to translate something confidential, you need to be careful about that. Um, yeah, uh, but there's other ways. Um, these days, the phones, of course, is brilliant. You know, you can download an app. I had an old lady um, uh, that was Italian, and I downloaded the app on my phone, and I used I spoke English and then I played it to her and it just makes her all oh, face light up that I can speak to her and I hold it there and she talks into it and I know what she's saying so yeah our phones are really cool yeah uh, we had an old islander lady oh we all loved her so much she we all called her mama and her and she reverted back to her language to to kill as well and um, her children came and they made this list of words and and they make with the phonics and stuff for us. And we um, misinterpreted one of the words and she used to have the giggle that I say. Because we would go, uh, I think it's KK, which is actually eat, I think. And we would go kaka and kaka, uh, we would go, yeah, instead of KK, we would go kaka and she'd laugh her head off and I'd go, what are you all about? We're actually saying to her, she needs to go to the toilet when she must eat or the other way around, you know? And she used to, but she was very clever. Whenever there was no one around, she would speak English to me. And I would tell everyone, she can understand. <laughs> she knows. And then she'd get this little twinkle in her eye and she would just carry on speaking in her own language and taking the mickey out of everyone, not knowing what she's saying. In the meantime, she just, you know, whenever I was alone with her in her room, let her getting her ready. I always used to sit on the floor and sit next to her on the on the um, shower chair and chat to her and she'd go ah, and she'd start talking to me in English, you know, because I'd always always take time to sit with her. And yeah, she was just so lovely. I just loved her so much. But she re she reverted back to her um, you know, her mother tongue. And this Italian lady as well, she just yeah, completely back. Germans they quite often often happen that um, we've got an old lady, she's um, standing 100, oh, this month in October, yeah, soon now she'll be 100, she's 99 last year when I looked after yeah, she's German, and she's gone back to, some days she just speaks German, and then they come and they come and call me, so she, I don't understand what she's saying, and she's just going off in German, because, yeah, they just go back to their own language, and then there's not always an interpreter around, you know. It's a bit hard. Picture cards can help to make a picture card or just to show me, or you know, sad. Sometimes people um, with some disabilities don't have language and you need, um, yeah. And uh, on iPads, quite often they would actually um, download an app on the iPad so they can just press on the iPad what they want, you know. So if they're hungry, they press hungry. And the iPad, we had a young man that one of my students was looking after and used to come to class with us. Um, he had autism, so, and he was quite, um, what is it, high, low, high on the spectrum? Very autistic. Less function, less function. Yeah, so he was low on the spectrum. So he didn't have much language structure and stuff. He was a big man. It was only 20, but it was a big boy to walk around with Barney, swinging Barney around. <laughs> and um, he, he, on his iPad, he would have, he has this, I mean, he always comes to the class and he used to sit in the back in the class with his back towards us, and then he would go, hungry. Because <laughs> the iPad would talk yeah. on his behalf, or would go, shopping. <laughs> we still sit in the class and he wants to go shopping now, and he, gets up and he starts pacing and then she knows, oh, okay, it's time to go. He wants to go shopping, you know, and off they go. So can use that. So yeah, translation is a bit of an issue. So laptops, 
tablets, um, yeah, some mobile phones, the internet, we can use that. Um, sometimes cult cultural brokers, maybe somebody that um, facilitates people from other cultures to cross over to another. Um, in other words, the act as mediators between people and different cultures enable them effective communication and reduce conflict. They act, um, more, they act as more than just an interpreter. Um, I don't know that word. In in fact, yeah, in fact, uh, in real terms. Okay. They would be known as the middleman. Okay. Yeah, that's good enough. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad somebody knows what it means. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, chapter four promoting understanding across diverse groups. Are we going for time? We'll be finished by 12, we'll have a short break and then um, we'll do the questions after. Um, promote our understanding across diverse groups, chapter 4.1, to identify issues that may cause communication misunderstandings or other difficulties. Um, oh, this blue is terrible, hey? Yeah. It's really hard, I must change the color. Due to people's diverse backgrounds, you may encounter communication problems or misunderstandings. Um, we spoke about that, you know, abbreviation, slang, jerk, uh, jargon. And um, sometimes in our industry, there's a lot of jargon. If this blue is really playing on my eyes now. Um, unclear organization rules and protocols. Um, there might be variations um, in expected behaviors. We've basically spoken about most of that. Where difficulties or misunderstandings occur, consider the impact of social and the social diversity. Yes, just like you know, putting the shoe on the other foot, really. You know, just step out of your comfort zone and you know, just try to understand what people are going through. Um, people who are in minorities are more vulnerable in a range of issues, and then that may affect their communication. You know, sometimes if you have somebody from a cultural background that never really had a voice, you know, never really spoke much. You might have a uh, young lady from a Muslim background that in her culture, they, they don't talk. They, you know, they're not allowed to, to sort of socialize as much or, you know, speak out. So um, they, they might be really quiet and you might never really know what they feel or what they understand. Um, of course, this thing, bullying is really a big thing. Um, in, even in our industry, there's a lot of bullies still. It's, um, my friend's daughter was really struggling at work and being bullied. She's really, she's very, uh, I don't know, she's, she's a bit of a pain in the butt, but it, you know, bluntly, she would just try to do things overly, you know, well, in a way, she's always trying to do things better, and you know, always trying to. She's still. Do... No, she just. She has this bit of an attitude that um, uh, I think she thinks sometimes she's better than others in some way, you know, and um, she tries to prove a point indirectly by always trying to be really correct in what she does. Um, but it's not. I don't think it comes from that point, but that's the way one can perceive it. You know, I don't. In her heart, I think it's just she's just trying to be good. Yeah. She just thinks she she's trying to be a good <laughs> girl and doing things good. You know, um, I don't think she's got any malice. Put it like that. Like she thinks she's better. Like mm -hmm. thing. I think she's just she's a good girl, and you know, she's always she's amazing. Actually, the way she supports her mom and. She's really good worker as well. Um, but people get annoyed with her because she's like that, and then they start bullying her. Mm. And the other, uh, other, actually last year, she went to management and she, she, she said uh, that she was being bullied. And management said to her, oh, just toughen up. You know, mm. and I thought that was a bit unfair because that sometimes happens. You know, people are getting bullied. I've never been bullied. Uh, I, would, I don't tolerate anyone bullying anyone, um, but it does happen. 
and I can't really identify with that or really understand it because no one looks in trouble with me. But you know, I, I, I. What's the right word? I, I would have some compassion in trying to understand that. I would also probably have been ten years ago of opinion. Just, just tell them all what's wrong with you. Why can't you just toughen up? You know, stand up for yourself. You know. Um, yeah. Oh, that can be so uh, Mm. Yeah, that can be chauvinistic. That's why I never married so I can die. <laughs> <laughs> rather than I don't like the attitude. They can be very chauvinistic, yeah. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it's not right. And actually bullying really, I think, um, can break down a person and, you know, break down their confidence. And if it happens over a long time, it causes serious mental health issues yeah. in that person. So um, being aware of that and, and advocating for somebody. I think in our services, we advocate for our clients, but we also need to advocate for people we work with. Um, I, I mean, again, working with a lot of young Filipino girls, they tiny little girls, and you know, and a lot of them are so lovely. And when they, you, you feel you want to protect them sometimes. You know, you want to step in for them and, and protect them, be on their side. So they, I, I know how it feels to be a foreigner, I suppose. And then I'm, I'm, I would easily identify with that side of it that they are struggling to fit in or you know, trying to please people. So. Um, and protect them. Yeah, and of course we have unemployed people, homeless people that um, impacts diversity. Just as a, a recap again, the influences in society that affects us, religion, media, the news, of course, you know, how we get affected by, um, you know, what we are constantly told, which sometimes might not even be right or correct. Um, People's individual upbringing, I always laugh at this because the way my mum kept washing off the line, I think I learned from my grandma. That's just the problem lies because my mum used to annoy me if she takes my washing off the line, but she scrambles it up and I'm thinking, and I'm like, really? No. And I'm coming from the same household. My sister does it differently as well, you know? We're from the same, we're meant to do these, these basic things the same, but we don't. You know, I've got a way of doing it and, and I always take three buckets out and I make sure that everyone's clothes in the bucket fold up. So yours is there, Sari's is there, my husband's is there and we, you know, it's easy. And then you pack it away straight away and it's no big problem. You know, everyone does it differently though, you know, and it's, um, it, we might think upbringing has a, you know, role to play, but it doesn't really always. Um, so some protective factors may be education and employment, uh, support from our family, understanding language and ability to practice culture opening, and writing and reading skills. So honestly, yeah, as long as we you know, keep training, learning, I love, like I say, I love languages. I've always, always been one of my strengths. So I do try to you know, learn just even a few words. We had an old Italian boy that I used to always you know, um, speak to him talk to him when I come into his room and speak to him and say, hola, como estas? And then he answer me and we have a little conversation. And yeah, he was so cute. He always used to lie there and go, Thursday, Thursday. The one day I came in his room and he said, Maria, what do you want? And he said, sing to me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he was so cute. I used to love him. And he taught me uh, quite a few Italian words because I'd go in there when I was feeding him and say, Mario, how do you say this? And then he would teach me some of his Italian words, which I just really loved. And I and we had another old boy. He was from um, uh, uh, Eastern Europe somewhere. And he spoke six languages. He was, um, I think he was Croatian or something like that, but he could speak 
um, German, you could speak Italian, you could speak Spanish, you could speak uh, Russian, um, and yeah, I forget, but he could speak. And when he, when he, just before he passed away, the last few months of his life, he'd actually mix up languages because he knew I could speak German and he knew I, could, I understand some Italian. He would mix up a whole heap of languages and people come and call me and say, uh, we don't understand what he's saying. Can you come and un hear what he's saying? And then I wouldn't be able to understand him because he's actually mixed it up all, you mm -hmm. know? It's just, um, yeah, so, but, uh, you know, getting to know the culture, getting behind it, do a little bit of research and understand the people you are looking after. Make an effort to be sensitive in resolving differences and take account of diverse conditions. Um, Negotiate cultural appropriate guidelines, you know, just training each other. We all should be in the sort of the um, attitude of, you know, helping people to be better and helping them to understand, you know, certain situations. When you work out in the community, you start working, You, we are all going to get body shifts. We're all going to be the body shift at some stage, but not long into your job, you're going to land up being the person who has to teach the next one because the turnover in our services are just so huge we just keep getting new staff in so you're going to be in that position we are going to have to teach somebody how to do stuff so get in that that um, way of you know communication where you try to explain to people things in a proper way you know trying to show them the right way as well it benefits all of us if we can do that um, Negotiate cultural appropriate guidelines, identify for appropriate mediation, uh, negotiate for a first code of practice. Address, with address any difficulties with appropriate people and seek resistance. So resolving difficulties, we said uh, interpreters, but we can also call on a family. We can also call on communication training and uh, uh, cultural diverse programs. So thank you very much. That's the end. Any questions? No? <laughs> All right, lovely. We'll have a short break. Um,